Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about lifespan development. Since this is for an introductory course, um, this is going to be a very basic um, overview of lifespan development. And we're going to talk a little bit about the areas of development that researchers typically study. Uh, we're going to talk about um, some basics, uh, the debate of nature versus nurture, uh, influences on development, uh, research on development, how you gather the information. We're going to talk about something called attachment styles. We're going to talk about theories commonly used in development, um, some of the bigger developmental theories. Uh, we're going to talk about um, something called uh, parent. Uh, we're going to talk about parenting styles, excuse me. Uh, and we're going to talk about something called temperament. Okay. So let's start. Um, when we talk about human growth and development, we're talking about change over time. We're talking about studying how human beings grow and develop over time. And the course of development goes from what we say womb to tomb. It goes from conception until death, from the moment that the sperm penetrates the egg until the human being passes away. Okay. Um, so that's lifespan development. And since we're talking about it from a psychological perspective, we're going to be focusing on how the human being develops and the ways that the human being develops um, that affect us or relate as closely as we can to psychology. So the areas of development that relate as closely as close as they can to psychology are going to be biological, social, uh, cognitive, and then we can say personality. Uh, personality tends to be a little bit separate. Um, sorry, personality tends to be a little bit um, related to cognitive, but it's not totally related. So it's a little bit separate. Um, so people talk about it slightly separately, but some people talk about it totally in the context of cognitive psychology. That's why it's there in blue with a question mark. Okay. So first, biological areas of development. Researchers that study the biological areas of development are studying what's happening physically, the structures of the brain, the structures of the, of the body. And as we get to um, the core of biology, we're talking about things like <clears throat> genetics, we're talking about DNA, etc. cetera. Um, so 23 chromosomes, the DNA is the basic unit of the chromosome, right? These are the basic building blocks. Um, this is not something that I'm gonna go very far into at all. I'm gonna kind of stop there on that only because it's not a course in biology. Um, true developmental psychologists that focus all their career on biological development will study this more, but for the purposes of this course, you don't need to know more than that. Um, developmental stages. First stage is conception, right, where the sperm penetrates the egg. That egg that has now been penetrated is called a zygote. And that is the fertilized egg. For the first two weeks after fertilization, you're going through, the, the, the baby is going through the germinal period. Um, just the name for the period. Uh, after that, embryonic from two to eight weeks. After that, the fetal period from eight weeks until conception. Okay. One important thing that happens during the, the period of development while the baby's in the uterus is something called um, critical periods. So a critical period is a time at which a an area of the baby or an area of the body is going through rapid physical development. That's a critical period. The reason why critical periods are important are twofold. The first reason why critical periods are important are because they are a way of paying physicians, uh, you know, um, medical doctors, etc., pay attention to these critical periods to see if the baby is developing, you know, on track, on term. If there's anything wrong, they'll notice it typically in a critical period. Um, so they will know when the brain typically starts rapid development, when it goes into its critical period. And if it's not starting on time, they know to pay attention. Um, or if it's not developing the way that it should, they pay attention during the brain's critical period. And each area of the body has a separate critical period. It goes through at different times. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. But each area has its own critical period. The other reason why critical periods tend to be very important are because critical periods are, during a critical period, let me say that differently, is a time at which the area of the body that's developing is highly susceptible to damage. Okay, it's an area, it's, it's a time when the area is developing and it is highly susceptible to damage. I'm gonna give you two examples. One of them is more concrete, one of them is a little bit more abstract. So, 
in, I believe it was the 60s, um, there was a medication that was released to treat morning sickness, which is when pregnant mothers get nauseous. Um, morning sickness can happen at any time during the pregnancy, but it tends to happen more frequently during the first trimester. Um, and so the critical period for limb development, arms and legs, is in the first trimester. And so there was a medication that was developed and it was called thalidomide. Thalidomide had a side effect. The side effect was it slowed down cell division and replication. The way that the body grows is through cell division and replication. So what would happen is mothers would take thalidomide during the first trimester and it would help with the morning sickness. But babies born to mothers that were taking thalidomide would frequently be born with malformed, underdeveloped, or missing arms and or legs. The reason why is because it slowed down cell division and reproduction. And we didn't know this. The, 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 provide, the, the inventors of the medication, the people who were using it, the prescribers didn't know any of this stuff. It was a terrible side effect. And it was something we only found out later. And it affected the arms and legs because they took it in the first trimester. And during the first trimester, it ended up, that was when the arms and legs were developing. And so that became the problem. Okay, and that, that caused a, you know, a huge issue. And if you Google um, thalidomide babies, you can see people that were born, um, and it's graphic images, right, of people that are missing or have malformed or severely underdeveloped arms and legs. One thinking process is, is that if they took it later on in the pregnancy, it wouldn't have had such a profound effect because the arms and legs would already be fully developed. So it wouldn't make that much of a difference, but they still, you know, ban thalidomide use um, in pregnancy. And they actually, uh, they still use thalidomide, believe it or not. It, it can be used as a cancer treatment because of its properties of slowing down cell growth and cell division and multiplication. Um, the, the flip side of that is they ban any mother from touch, any female, I should say, from touching it even uh, because of the potential harmful effects. They don't want to take that chance. The second example I'm going to use to illustrate the concept of critical periods uh, is very abstract. It's, it's with concrete. So if anybody's ever done any construction work or used concrete um, in the past, then you know that when you're mixing concrete, concrete goes through this critical period. The critical period is when you're mixing the water in with the sand, right? Concrete has the two ingredients, the water and then the concrete mix, which is mostly sand and some curing agents and things like that. The critical period of concrete development is when you're mixing the water in the sand and the water has to be just right. If there's too much water, it's too watery and the concrete won't set up. If there's not enough water, the sand is too, the concrete is too sandy and it doesn't stick together and it doesn't form, you know, a solid support. So let's pretend we're building a building. Okay. We're building the building outside. If we're going to be working with concrete prior to working with the concrete, Right, the concrete is stored away, we're not taking it out yet. If we have a terrible rainstorm, it doesn't affect the concrete because we haven't started working with it yet. If the structure is already built and all the concrete is poured and it's all dried and set up and we have a terrible downpour, what happens to the concrete? Nothing. It gets wet, gets it dries off, no problem. If while we're mixing the concrete, and now this is during concrete's critical period, if while we're mixing the concrete, we get a terrible downpour and it falls all over the concrete and the concrete gets soaked and there's too much water there, it gets washed out. What happens to the concrete? The concrete's useless. So in this case, the water that could damage concrete affected the concrete during its critical period. And so it had more of a damaging effect on the concrete, okay? This is just a, um, a silly example, but hopefully it makes the point, okay? Now, anything, in the right amounts can become a teratogen. A teratogen is something that adversely infects development. Okay, so anything in high enough amounts can be a teratogen. There are certain common teratogens that we know of, diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, um, smoking, uh, prescription medications, uh, certain prescription medications, certain over-the-counter medications, um, substances of abuse, environmental issues, lead, x-ray, radiation, uh, any one of these things can become a teratogen. A teratogen is anything, any environmental thing that has an, an adverse impact on development while the baby is in the uterus. Now, 
the impact will be worse or likely be worse during the critical period, although this can never be fully predicted. Okay, um, so that's why we talk about critical periods. And again, a teratogen is anything that adversely impacts development. Um, it's a broad thing, um, but it's, a, it's, it's just anything that adversely impacts development. And typically the teratogen is worse during the critical period. Okay, all right. <sighs> Prenatal influences on development. Um, nutrition of the mother, uh, if the mother's going through anxiety or stress, the mother and father's general health, physical and mental health, um, ages of the parents. You know, we know that 35 for females tends to be the, that, that kind of jump off point for, um, for Down syndrome. So prior to 35, the likelihood of Down syndrome is lower, much, much lower after 35 or at the age and after 35, the chances of Down syndrome happening are much higher, okay? They increase dramatically. Um, what we're also learning is that the father's age um, has an effect as well. We never really knew this in the past. But what we're learning now is that the age of the father makes a difference. There's some correlational research um, where we see a relationship. Again, it's not causal. We don't say one is causing the other. Um, but there's some correlational research where we see that there's a relationship between the increased age in the father and increased instances of children being born with autistic spectrum disorder. 45 seems to be that number. The other thing that we're noticing with the age of 45 is that the number of uh, malformed or um, you know damaged sperm that the father produces increases dramatically at the age of 45. So they're now encouraging fathers, if they want to, um, if they want to have a child, to do it prior to the age of 45, because sperm quality decreases dramatically at the age of 35. Okay. All right. Now, research and development. So we talked before about the idea that development is the study of change over time. So whenever we're doing research um, in psychology or in particularly in development let me say um, we have to study how that change um, goes over time what happens over time okay so um, if we're studying change over time we need to find a way to account for time in that research so there are three common ways of doing research in development okay to account for time all right this is not you know basic research methods, right? You know, you can use any one of the basic research methods that we talked about, but in these research methods, time is always going to be a factor. It's an additional thing to consider. Okay, so if you're doing a survey, you could still do your survey, basic research methods, but if you're surveying people and you want to find out something about how that thing changes over time, time has to be a factor. So what we're specifically talking about in research and development is how do we set up research design in a way that accounts for time. So one way to do this is with cross-sectional research. And each of these ways is going to have um, ben their own benefits and their own drawbacks. So cross-sectional research is where we take a cross-section of people. So a number of people at different ages and study them over time. Okay, so let's say we're studying height. We want to see how height changes over time. Okay, so if we're studying height over time, um, we might take a group of five-year-olds, a group of 10-year-olds, and a group of 15-year-olds, and we're going to study how their height changes over time. The way that we'll do this with cross-sectional research is I'm going to measure the five-year-olds, I'll measure the 10-year-olds, and I'll measure the 15-year-olds. I'll compare them to each other, and let's say I get an average of the five-year-olds. The five-year-olds are an average of three feet high. The 10-year-olds are four feet, and the 15-year-olds are five feet. That's it. So a foot every five years, right? I'm making these numbers up, okay? But that's what we find out. And we can plot that, trend that, whatever, right? And then we have our, our growth rate over time. Simple, straightforward, etc. okay? So that's cross-sectional research. There are benefits and drawbacks to cross-sectional research. The benefits are that it's a quick way to do research. I just have to gather my groups, measure my groups, and compare them. No problem. The drawbacks of cross-sectional research are that I'm proverbially comparing apples to oranges, meaning I'm comparing one group to another group to another group. And it's possible that something happened to one group 
that didn't happen to another group. Okay, so something could have affected one group in their development that is giving us results that might not be accurate. For example, um, let's say I am. Um, let's say there was a famine. Okay, let's say there was a, a lack of food. Uh, let's say there was a lack of food twelve years ago, a severe lack of food that caused people to be malnourished for a year. Let's say. Okay, then the lack of food disappeared, the nourishment continued, etc. Well, that would have tremendously affected the 15-year-olds because they were alive 12 years ago. The 10-year-olds and the 5-year-olds weren't, which means that I'm getting an average height of the 15-year-olds of 5 feet. But what if they weren't malnourished? Maybe the 15-year-olds would have averaged 5.5 feet. So if I was studying growth trends, it might have been three feet, four feet, five and a half feet. There might have been a huge growth spurt between the ages of 10 and 15. And if that's the case, I won't know it because something, and I'm getting misleading results here, because I'm only seeing a rate of growth from 10 to 15 based on these groups of one foot, and maybe it would normally average a foot and a half. And I won't know that because I won't know what a normal sorry, unaffected group of 15-year-olds would look like because my sample had all been affected by this famine, okay? So one of the drawbacks is that since we're comparing apples to oranges, there could have been an environmental effect that happened to one of the groups that affected their outcome and is causing us, you know, to have sort of inaccurate results. The second thing is these groups could have started off very differently, right? They, they could be not representative samples. They could have started off. I could have, you know, my, my 15 year olds, maybe I got a random group of 15 year olds that were tall for their age at the age of five. And now that I'm seeing them at 15, I'm getting all these tall kids, right? Um, so that's something to think about, right? That's always an issue. So the benefits of cross-sectional research are that they tend to, it tends to be very quick. It tends to not cost a lot. Um, the drawbacks of cross-sectional research are that I'm comparing one group to another and there might have been certain effects that happened to one group and not another. I'm comparing apples to oranges, etc. One way to account for this is by doing something called longitudinal research. So if you're looking at this slide, um, longitudinal research is where we take one group and follow it over time. So let's say that we took this group of white cherries all the way on the left here. Okay, and I'm following this group of white cherries. Sorry. That. Uh, I'm following this group of white cherries, this one group, over time as it ages. Okay? The benefits of this are that any environmental effects are happening to all the groups equally because they're all alive at the same time, they're all around at the same time, etc. And so if that's the case, um, I'm not worried about the environment affecting one group and not another and getting, you know, inconsistent environmental effects. Again, the environmental effects could have affected this group dramatically, and this group might not represent groups that come earlier and might not represent groups that come later. But for the meanwhile, for this period of time, you know, at least the results are representing this group. Okay. The drawbacks to longitudinal. And so the data tends to be good, right? The drawbacks to longitudinal research are pretty straightforward. It takes a very long time to do this research. Imagine I'm doing the study that I said before, 5 to 15. So I need to get a group of 5-year-olds, measure their height, and I can get the group of 5-year-olds fairly quickly. But I now have to wait until they become 15. So I can measure them every week, every month, every year, whatever it is, every 5 years. But it's going to take me 10 years for the 5-year-olds to get to the age of 15. It takes a long time. And it could be even 11 years, depending on how old the five-year-olds were when they started, um, to getting, you know, if I want to measure them at the beginning of the age of five and the end of age 15, etc., it could be 11 years. It's a long time. And a lot of things can happen in a long period of time, in a 10-year in, in period, right? Um, subjects could disappear. Um, you could move. You could change your contact information. You could just decide you don't want to be part of the study anymore. Subjects could pass away. Right, and we call we call the loss of subjects over time attrition. Okay, and longitudinal research is very subject to attrition. That becomes a big problem because maybe I start my study with a thousand people, and maybe by the time I get to the end of the research, only two hundred people show up. That's a big problem because what ends up happening is that I am now comparing only two hundred people to themselves over time. 
And because I'm only comparing 200 to themselves over time, I don't know what happened to the other 800. Right. If, again, if I'm doing heights and I'm going from, let's say, the height of a five-year-old to the height of a 15-year-old, what if the 800 that left the study didn't grow as much or grew a lot more? I'll never know. And I can only work with what I still have left in the sample. It's also very expensive. right? To continue a research study for 10 or 11 years is very expensive. It's a hard thing to do. You have to pay the principal investigator, the person who's running the research. You have to figure out ways to store the data. People might leave the research study and other people might take over. So you have to you know, prep them and give them all the information and make sure they're following the same protocols. It's complicated and it's expensive. The data can be great, right? There are some huge studies that have been done. Harvard did a landmark study. Um, I think it took like 80 or 90 years where they were studying aging in men. And if you wanted to know more about it, you can you can Google, you know, Harvard um, aging male study or male aging study. And I'm sure it'll come up. Um, the results just came out about five, six years ago, but they started this research study 80 years ago. Um, I think the original researcher had passed away and somebody had to take over the research. Um, they weren't getting a lot of, you know, data early on that they could use and people couldn't publish on this. And, you know, there's always a pressure to publish um, on your research. Um, but, you know, people debate whether or not you should publish before the data is fully in, etc. So there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things about uh, longitudinal research that get complicated and expensive. Again, the data can be really good, but it can get complicated and expensive over time. Um, so with that, um, it's difficult to do. It's expensive. It takes a long time. Uh, again, the data can be good. So we try to account for this by creating another research style called cross-sequential research. So if you look in the top left corner of this slide, um, you see a chart, okay? So um, what we're looking at in the chart's a little complicated, so you might want to pause and kind of process the chart a little bit. Um, but what we're looking at in this chart is, excuse me, what we're looking at in this chart are two groups that they're comparing over time. So with cross-sequential research, you're trying to eliminate the drawbacks of cross-sectional research and longitudinal research and you're trying to use all the benefits of both cross-sectional research and longitudinal research so in this case you have two groups okay you have a group of uh, six-year-olds and a group of eight-year-olds so i'm going to draw a little bit here here are the group of six-year-olds and here is the group of eight-year-olds okay and you're going to try to compare them over time so let's say we're using a similar research study that we've been talking about, all right? Same thing, height over age, right? We wanna see how people grow over time, okay? So you take your two groups, they're gonna use different ages than we used in our previous example. So they have a six year old, a group of six-year-olds and a group of eight-year-olds, and they're gonna track this group of six-year-olds as they age to eight and to 10, and you're going to track this group of eight-year-olds as they age from eight to 10 and 10 to 12. So really what we're studying here is how people age over time. So we might be studying how people, age, how, pe sorry, how people grow over time. So we might be studying how people start at six and how tall they get to 12 years. So if you were doing a true longitudinal research study, how long would this take? It would take from the age of six all the way to 12 which is six or seven years, depending on how you look at it, okay? But the way this study is set up, what we want to do is, what we're going to do is, we're going to grab our six-year-olds here. We're going to measure all of our six-year-olds. We're going to grab our eight-year-olds, measure our eight-year-olds. We can do this in one day or a couple of days. Immediately, when we're comparing this group to this group, we're getting cross-sectional comparisons, right? The same thing. So now we see how much they've grown. So the six-year-olds might be, let's say, three and a half feet tall, and the eight-year-olds might be four feet tall, okay? Or three foot ten, let's say. So now I already have a cross-sectional comparison. But this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to follow both of these groups over time. I'm going to follow the six until they become eight and the eight till ten. I'm going to follow the 8 till 10 and the 10 till 12, okay? I'm going to follow them. I'm going to follow these two groups, okay? As I'm following these two groups, I'm also getting longitudinal data. I'm getting longitudinal data from the 6 to the 10, and I'm getting longitudinal data from the 8 to the 12, okay? 
So I'm getting longitudinal data. All right, now let's erase this. But the interesting thing here is that I'm also getting data where I'm comparing the eight-year-olds, so the eight-year-olds here, excuse me, to the other group when they were eight. So let's say this is group A, and this is group B. I'm comparing the eight-year-olds in group A to what the eight-year-olds in group B were when they were eight. Okay, so I'm comparing these guys to these guys. And that gives me interesting data. Okay, the reason why it's interesting is, is because I'm getting sort of three data sets for every group. I'm getting the comparison of this group to itself. I'm getting the comparison of this group to this group, right? This group to this group, excuse my drawing, this group to this group. But I'm also getting this group to this group, and I'm getting this group to this group, right? Which is getting me this cross comparison. So let's just do round numbers here. I know I'm jumping all over the place, but let's just do round numbers to make it make more sense. Let's say these th six year olds, when they were here, were three feet. Okay? And let's say these eight year olds are four feet. What would we expect these eight-year-olds to be based on that data? We'd expect them to have started at four feet. And these, let's say these eight, these ten-year-olds are five feet, and these twelve-year-olds are six feet. Again, I'm making up very random numbers. These ten-year-olds should be five feet, right? This should match. This should match. It's two different groups. Now, if for some reason this group is not four feet. They started off as five feet, and then they stayed five feet, and then they jumped to six. But this group was three, four, and five feet. What does that tell us about the groups? That they're different groups, right? The groups might not be subject to a good comparison because there's something very different about this group than there is with this group, and that could be problematic. If these numbers match, like we set up originally, well, then the groups can be compared. You get the intra-group data and the inter-group data, which theoretically would be a good thing. And we can kind of compare these things back and forth. Now, look, this is not a perfect research design. You could get two very different groups, um, and it still does take time. This study, which would normally take, if we're studying from 6 to 12, right, if it was one group longitudinally, it would take seven years, let's say, six or seven years. But this study only takes four years, four to five, rather than six to seven. Same thing. You started both of these groups at the same time. So it's still the same four to five years total. Total for the whole research, four to five years. Okay? It's not like I have to start this later. Okay? I start both of these at the same time. So that's good. So you're reducing some of the potential attrition. You can still have attrition. You still have cost. It's not as expensive as longitudinal research. You're not going to lose as many people. And you're going to get both within and between group data. And you're going to get the cross-sectional piece, right? Because you're comparing group A to group B or group 1 to group 2, whatever you want to call it. So it's all good stuff, right? Um, so it's not perfect, but it has almost all the benefits of longitudinal research. Um, and, you know, some of the benefits of cross-sectional research where you're comparing between groups. It does take longer than cross-sectional research, um, but it does, it does have a lot of the benefits. Okay? All right. So, moving forward, okay, socio-emotional development, okay, let's see here, hold on one second, okay, socio-emotional development, okay, so we're going to start to talk about <clears throat> um, what's happening sort of interpersonally with development, then we'll get into develop development theories, uh, and then we will get into uh, temperament. Okay, so one thing that's been studied quite a bit, and I will let you watch the um, the, the the videos on your own. Oh, forgive me, there's a typo here. Um, um, but one thing that we talk a lot about in development is uh, something called attachment. Um, but I'll let you watch the video on your own. The video is helpful. I would actually pause this now, uh, watch the video, and then come back to this. 
Um, but one thing that we study quite a bit is something called attachment. And the attachment is the parent-child relationship. Attachment relationships are the, or attachments are the strong uh, bond, typically that the, the first attachment is a strong bond that the individual has with their primary caregiver, typically their mother or their father. The reason why we study attachments is because attachments tend to be the building blocks of all other relationships. If the child has a healthy attachment with their primary caregiver, then they typically develop healthy attachments in their interpersonal relationships later on in life with friends, with other family members, with significant others, etc. Okay, um, so the attachment, studying attachment becomes important. All right, okay. When research was done on attachment, and if you've watched the video already, which I highly suggest that you do, when research was done on attachment, Mary Ainsworth was the main attachment researcher, one of the biggest ones. Um, she studied attachment styles. And so she studied, she set up a, an experiment called the strange situation. And what happened in the strange situation was there was the primary caregiver and an infant in a room, or a toddler, I should say, in a room uh, with a stranger and some toys. And what they would do is they would have the toddler in the room with the primary caregiver and the stranger and the toys all together. And at a certain point, the primary caregiver would get a cue to leave the room and then they would come back after a little while. And they watched what happened. They watched what happened when the primary caregiver was in the room with the child. Then they watched what happened when the primary caregiver left the room. And then they watched what happened when the primary caregiver returned, the reunion. What they expected to happen or what they hypothesized should happen in a healthy attachment or healthy relationship was that when the primary caregiver was in the room, the child would explore the room and keep checking in with the parent. They'd crawl away, play with some toys, come back, be with the mom, crawl away, play with some toys, come back again. They would use the parent as a secure base, right? If you play tag, you run to base, you're safe there, and then you run out for a little bit, and then you go back to base again, right? So the children with a secure attachment style would do that. When the parent would leave, the child would get a little bit upset, <clears throat> calm down, and then play with the toys and interact with the stranger. When the parent returned, they were happy to see the child. Okay, That was what they described as a secure attachment. They said that that was demonstrating a healthy relationship with the primary caregiver. But there were three other, well, two other patterns they saw, and then one other just kind of random set of behaviors in the same situation. Um, children that developed what they called an avoidant attachment were children that seemed to ignore the parent when they were in the room. They didn't really kind of use them as a secure base. They seemed to ignore the stranger, um, and they didn't really seem to care when the parent came back. Okay? Um, so that was what they called an avoidant attachment. Um, a resistant attachment, also known as amb an ambivalent attachment, um, is when the child was almost hyper attached. There's no other way to kind of say it. So when the parent was in the room, the child would cling to the parent. They wouldn't explore. Uh, when the parent left, the, the child would cry and tantrum and not self-soothe. And when the parent came back, the child might get angry with the parent because they were so super attached and the leaving and the separation was so stressful that they couldn't handle the loss. And so since they couldn't handle the loss, they became angry and aggressive um, when the parent returned, okay? The last attachment style is what they called disorganized. And disorganized was where they didn't really fit into any one of the previous patterns of attachment, okay? They didn't fit into the secure. They might have at one point, you know, not seemed to care when the parent was in the room, which would, you know, be similar to an avoidant attachment style, but then when they were alone with the stranger, they might tantrum tremendously, and then when the parent came back, they might be happy to see them. That might be one example of disorganized attachment. But it was just contradictory and unclear, um, and, and, and unclear patterns, right? So that was the last one. And statistically, that was the smallest group. I think about 80 some odd percent of children demonstrated a secure attachment, uh, and then the numbers go down from there. Okay, and disorganized was very low. I think it might have been less than 3%. Okay, so moving on from attachments, and again, this is just a survey of big topics in development. I'm not going too deep into any of them. If you take a lifespan development course or study lifespan development, you'll definitely get into these uh, a lot more deeply later on. But right now we're doing a very, very basic um, overview of development. Okay, so 
theories in development. All right. Um, there are a number of theories in development. When we talk about theories, you know, a theory is just kind of a big idea, uh, a way of understanding what's going on, right? How we process information. Um, so Freud was an early and big developmental theorist. And he said that, you know, the way people develop over time, um, psychologically, is by going through stages. Um, and he described his stage theory as having five stages, the oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital stage. And he basically said that within each stage, the individual is supposed to basically navigate this stage and then move on to the next one. If they move on, that's fine. That's healthy development. If they get, if they don't move on, they get stuck in the stage. And he says that they become fixated in that stage. Okay. The first stage, the oral stage goes from birth to one year. And in that stage, the child takes in the world through their mouth. Okay. So every interaction they have is through their mouth, right? And he said that they get gratification. Now he didn't mean gratification in, in, in the sense of happiness. He meant gratification as there was an urge to stimulate the mouth and babies do have this, right? If you've ever seen a baby, everything goes in the mouth. Um, they have an urge to stimulate the mouth and when they have stimulated the mouth appropriately, they're satisfied. Um, and he basically said that if the baby gets enough oral stimulation in that birth to one year age, they move on to the anal stage. If they don't, they get stuck in the oral stage and they're looking for oral gratification for the rest of their lives. Um, as an adult, somebody who's fixated in the oral stage might chew their nails, chew on pens, might become a smoker, might chew gum, might even become an alcoholic, anything to stimulate the mouth because they're fixated in that oral stage. If they move past this, they go to the anal stage. In the anal stage, this is about control, right? Um, it's about, you know, from, from one to three, you're going through that potty training stage. And it's really about control, right? It's not as basic as, you know, getting pleasure from holding or expelling feces. It's about the child demonstrating and learning a level of control. If you've ever potty trained a child, you see they have to learn to control. They have to learn to control their sphincters. They have to learn to not let out the waste too soon. And then they have to learn to let out the waste when they're supposed to, on the toilet or near the toilet, etc. Um, if the child demonstrates successful control in this stage, they move on. If they don't, they might be fixated in this stage. They might be seeking that excessive control for the rest of their lives. So they might be, as an adult, overly neat overly clean, overly orderly, overly organized, or anal, as we call it. And that actually comes from Freud's theory. If they move on, they're in that three to six stage, the phallic stage. And in the three to six stage, this is where, you know, people kind of get uncomfortable when we talk about Freud. So in the three to six, in the three, let, uh, sorry, excuse me, um, in that uh, three to six year age range, um, the child begins to, as Freud would say, discover their own sexual pleasure, right? Basics of sexuality, right? They stimulate the penis. Um, girls stimulate the clitoris, right? By touching it, okay? Um, and he said masturbation, right? But when he says masturbation, he doesn't mean the same type of masturbation that adults would do. Masturbation is just sexual self-stimulation. They touch the penis because it feels good. They touch the clitoris because it feels good. That's it. It's not like they're masturbating the same way that an adult would. Okay. Um, and he said they develop basic sexual urges and these sexual urges are channeled toward the first person available. And typically the first person available is the parent. So boys will channel these sexual urges toward the opposite sex parent, the mom, and girls will channel these sexual urges toward the opposite sex parent or the father. Um, in a heterosexual relationship, obviously it doesn't have to be set up this way. Right. Um, but in a heterosexual relationship, that's what they would do. And at a certain point, um, this is what Freud called the Oedipal or Electra complex. The Oedipal complex is where uh, boys develop an attraction to their mothers, and the Electra complex is when girls develop an attraction to their fathers. And this is normal. But what also has to happen is that girls need to, and boys need to be rejected by that opposite sex parent. Okay? If they're not rejected, they get stuck in this phallic stage and they spend the rest of their lives being in love with or pining after the opposite sex pair. If they're rejected, they go into the latency stage and the sexual urges or desires are temporarily shut down. 
And in this latency stage, the superego develops. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, so we'll skip that for now. Um, eventually, the sexual urges come back and they go into what Freud called the genital stage. And in that stage, that's when they develop healthy sexual relationships, right? So the latency stage goes from six to adolescence approximately, and the genital stage goes from adolescence through the rest of your life. Okay, uh, that's Freud's theory. And in that stage, the general stage, you're looking at developing healthy, appropriate adult relationships. Okay, now, um, another component of Freud's development or developmental theory is something called the unconscious processes, right? So Freud said that we had three different processes working. Most of them were unconscious, outside of our awareness, um, but they were partly in our conscious. And he said we had these three different processes working all the time. And these three different processes were sort of fighting against each other. And the three different components of our psyche, according to Freud, were the id, and I'll circle these things here, um, the id, not id, it's id, the superego, and the ego. So the id and the ego are present from birth and the superego develops in that latency stage. Okay, um, so the id functions on what we call the pleasure principle. The id wants what it wants when it wants it, immediate gratification, okay? The superego functions on what we call the reality principle, looking at your surroundings, knowing where you're at, and then deciding, is it safe and is it feasible to satisfy the id? Why or why not? Okay, so I'll give you a um, I'll give you an example. So if you have a one-year-old, let's say, uh, and the one-year-old has a sibling, and they go near the sibling, right, and they get angry, they might want to hit the sibling, right? The id says, "I'm angry, I want to hit," so they, they hit, right? The one-year-old is all id, mostly id. They hit, and so you start redirecting, you start doing something to, you know change this behavior you might and i'm not encouraging any of this you know you decide but you might engage in timeouts or redirection or something like that after you do this for a while the what the child will do what the one-year-old will do is come up near the, the the sibling and you know want to hit the sibling and then they'll look around and they'll see if you're there and if you're there they might not hit the sibling right because that's the ego stepping in and the ego saying don't do this you'll get a timeout don't do this you'll get in trouble but if you're not around they might hit the sibling right? Because the ego is saying, well, I can get away with this now and I'm not going to get in trouble. Excuse me. <clears throat> so that's the ego kind of stepping in. Eventually over time, the super ego develops, okay? The super ego develops in that latency stage and the super ego is your conscience, not conscious, conscience your morality principle, your right or wrong, okay? So I'm gonna have you go through a thought exercise for a second, um, and you do this on your own. But here's the thought exercise, <clears throat> okay? So you're a Kingsborough student, and you go to school every day and you take the bus. And on your way to the bus, there's a bodega. And every day you stop in the bodega and you get a cinnamon danish. You give the person that works at the bodega a dollar, and you take your cinnamon danish, you walk out, okay? And you do this every day. It's your routine. All of a sudden, it's now graduation week. You've made it through Kingsborough. Congratulations. Um, you're about to graduate, and you're online at the bodega, and somebody in front of you is buying the cinnamon danish, same one that you buy every day. So they give the person behind the counter a dollar, and the person behind the counter gives them a quarter back. And you stop for a second, and now it's your turn. And you ask that you, you give them a, a dollar and you ask the, the bodega person, you know, how, how much is this cinnamon Danish? And they say 75 cents and they give you a quarterback and they say, have a nice day. And you walk out and now you're confused because you're realizing that maybe this was 75 cents <clears throat> all along and you start to do math. So Kingsborough students typically go to school four days a week. Four days a week, four, four times 25 is a dollar, dollar a week. They go to school 24 weeks a year, let's say, $24 a year. And let's say you've been at the college for four years, four times 24 is just under $100. It's $96. And you're like, wait a minute, this is real money. 
So now you go back into the bodega the next day. And when you walk in, and, you know, obviously you're upset because you feel like you, you know, you lost the 96 bucks. And you're in the bodega and you look and the bodega owner is in the back stocking the refrigerator back to you. And you see the cash register drawers open and there's way more than $96 in there. Now, pause for a second and ask yourself this question. What are your first thoughts? Okay, I'll let you think about that for a second. Some common first thoughts are things like, I'm going to take all the money. Other common first thoughts are things like, um, you know, I shouldn't steal two wrongs, don't make a right. Other thoughts are, um, are there cameras around? Okay. Other thoughts are, well, I'm just going to take the $96 back. Other people think, well, I'm going to confront him or her, right? Um, or they. Um, well, let me change the scenario a little bit. What I didn't tell you was the bodega owner had, was wearing gang colors, had teardrops coming down by their eye and definitely had a weapon on them. Does that change your thinking? Okay, think about it for a second. Okay, there's no right or wrong. There are no right or wrong answers to this question. The ones who think, I'm going to take all the money, right? That thought is coming from your ego. I want what I want when I want. It. I want all the money back. The thought process in your head that says it's wrong to steal is your superego. It's your conscience. And the, excuse me, the thought that says I want to take all the money is the id. Sorry, I hope I didn't say ego. It's the id. It says I want what I want when I want it. The thought that says it's wrong to steal is a superego. The thought that says are there cameras, meaning what's the reality that I get away with this, um, or the thought process that changed once I told you that this person was probably gang affiliated and potentially dangerous right and said maybe i shouldn't do this because the ramifications might be much worse than somebody just yelling at me for stealing right that's the ego can i get away with this what's it like okay freud argued that these things are battling it out all the time some people have a tendency to be more id based listen to their impulses some people have a tendency to be morality based but it's the combination of all these things that make you who you are according to freud Okay, and so that really is at the core of your personality. All right, that's what Freud is really talking about. And that's Freudian theory in a nutshell. An alternative to Freudian theory was Erickson's analytical theory. Erickson was a follower of Freud, but he revised Freud's theory a lot. His theory had eight stages. Freud had, eight, uh, had five. The ages of his original stages were the same. But what Erickson did differently was two things. He focused on interpersonal interactions, right? Um, you know, parent-child relationships um, or social relationships and the individual. And he focused on not psychosexual stages, um, but he focused on these interpersonal stages. And he also split adulthood into three different stages, not just one long stage like Freud had it, okay? Okay. Erickson didn't believe in the unconscious as much, um, and he didn't say you could get stuck in a stage. He said that in each stage was a conflict, and depending on how you negotiated that conflict, the result of that stayed with you for the rest of your life, and you moved on from there, having internalized the results of that conflict. Okay? All right. So the first stage, trust versus mistrust, from birth to a year. In this stage, the according to Erickson, the individual needed all of their needs provided for, okay? So they had to be fed, kept warm, clothed, sheltered, kept safe, everything else. Um, if they were, they would develop trust. If they were not given, if they were not cared for completely, they developed mistrust, and they'd internalize this and then have this as part of them for the rest of their lives. So as an adult, the person that developed mistrust might be suspicious of relationships, they might be slow to connect with people, they might, you know, mistrust bosses and things like that, right? Versus the person that's trusting, you know, this is the person that will sign a contract without ever reading it, right? This is the person that will, you know, take somebody's word for it and not really critique them, etc. Right? So that's the that that would be if they develop trust. The next stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. And it's, you know, can the 
can I begin to take care of myself? If you do everything for the child in this stage and don't let them explore and develop, then they develop shame and doubt. They doubt their abilities. If you allow them to do things on their own, they would develop a certain level of what he said was autonomy. Okay, uh, initiative versus guilt, you know, sort of an advancement of autonomy versus shame and doubt. And in this case, you know, can they start making choices? Can they explore um, and do things on their own? Um, industry versus inferiority. Um, this stage is where they start the stage of social comparison, right? This is where they're in school. This is where they're looking at who, you know, does better academically, who's more athletic, who gets more attention, etc. Am I as good as others? Am I competent or not? Uh, and again, they can internalize either way. So one person, if you're comparing person A to person B, person A might have developed trust, shame, guilt, and industry. Person B might have developed mistrust, um, shame, initiative, and, and industry, right? And it just manifests itself in different ways and in different behaviors as an adult. Um, in stage five, they're going through identity versus role confusion. This is where the individual is supposed to figure out who they are as an individual. And in this stage, they can accept their parents' teachings. They can take what they like from their parents' teachings and, you know, get rid of others. Or they can be totally their own person. The big thing in this stage, the big thing that they're looking for is something called identity achievement, where the individual creates their own unique, unique identities by taking the influences of their parents, of their environment, and making their own choices. That's the goal, according to Erickson. Okay? Um, in young adulthood, he said it was relationships, pairing up, intimacy versus um, isolation, where you develop long-term lasting relationships. Um, and then middle age is generativity versus stagnation, uh, where you look at your life and are you happy with what you're doing? Are you contributing to society as a whole or are you stagnating? Do you feel like you're not um, doing what you need to do as society? You're not having children if that's what you want. Are you not in a rewarding career if that's what you want? Are you not you know, traveling as much as you want, etc.? All the things that you would want to do if you're a generative um, and then this is, you know, kind of that concept of the whole midlife crisis. If you're not happy with what you're doing, you do something different, right? You, you sell the Porsche, you sell the minivan and get a Porsche. Um, and then the last stage is the integrity versus despair stage. Uh, and in this stage, um, it's more of a reflective stage because this is older adulthood. You don't have a lot of time to sort of reinvent yourself. Um, so you look back on your life with either integrity, you feel good about what you did in, in your life, or you look back with despair. Okay, where you look back on your life and you're like, oh, you know what, I lost this, I lost that, you know, or I shouldn't have done this, or this was a waste, etc. Okay, that's Erickson in a nutshell. Again, I'm going very quickly through this because it is a basic survey of, you know, human developmental concepts. An alternative theory to Erickson is Piaget's theory. Piaget studied cognitive development, right? We talked about the domains of development. Uh, Erickson was more social, psychosocial. Um, Piaget is more cognitive. Okay, so Piaget had a developmental theory of stages, um, and he focused on the thought process of the individual. So what he studied was how the thinking process evolves and develops over time. And he said the individual goes through four distinct stages. The ages are different with Piaget than they were with Erickson. First stage is birth to two, the next is, is two to six, the next is six to 12, and the next is 12 to, you know, through the rest of your life. His first stage was what he called the sensory motor stage. And in the sensory motor stage of development, the individual takes in information in their senses. Very, very basic, okay? Um, I taste something, it tastes good, I, I put it in my mouth again, I taste it, it tastes bad, I spit it out, right? They explore their environment, you know, they, they, pick up objects, they examine objects, etc. They hopefully will learn to imitate other people, copying behaviors. And one of the um, developmental milestones is anticipation of events, where you do something and expect something to happen, right? This is where um, you can see in children, you know, if they do something and you clap, they look up, they notice you, and then they'll do that same thing again and then look at you again to see if you're clapping or if you're going to clap, right? That is an anticipation of events. Okay, they do something and they expect something to happen. They're anticipating the next response. Um, another thing that happens is something called object permanence, right? These are the achievements that the individual has to go through to move on to the next stage. 
Object permanence is the understanding that even if something is out of sight, it still exists. One of the reasons why very young children like peekaboo so much is because when you hide, they think you've really disappeared. You're gone. And then when you pop up again, you've come back and they didn't know where you came from because you didn't exist anymore when you were out of sight. When kids get older, they don't like peekaboo so much anymore because they know you're hiding. Oh, it's not so funny, right? You know, I know you're behind the couch or I know, you know, you're behind that magazine or whatever, right? So these are the achievements in the sensory motor stage. And you can watch these videos, right? There are video links here of some examples of these things. Um, the pre-operation stage um, is where the individuals continue to develop cognitively, right? They tend to get richer mental images. They'll start to do make-believe play. This is where they'll make-believe their, their toys and dolls are people. They might talk like the, the, the doll, etc. Um, they might pretend that they're um, you know, in like an action scene or something from a TV show or pretend that they're different characters, etc. Right? This is one of the achievements of the pre-operation stage. They tend to be very limited. They tend to be rigid, right? They think in certain ways and it's hard to change their thinking. Um, they don't have what we call conservation. Conservation is the understanding that objects, when they're changed, still retain their initial properties or their main properties. And if you watch this video link that's linked at the bottom here, um, you'll see one of the big conservation experiments um, where they take a child and they go through a number of permutations of this. But one of the famous ones was where they have two glasses that are filled with the same amount of a liquid. And then you pour that liquid from one glass into a taller, more narrow glass and they ask the child which has more, and despite the child seeing that they're both the same and nothing changed other than it's put in a different container, we'll say that the taller one has more, right? That's one of the limits of the pre-operation stage, and you'll see it in the video. Another limit is something called egocentrism, where they see everything from their own perspective. So an example of this would be, you know, when um, two parents separate and they tell the child, the first thing the child's going to say is, it's my fault. And the parents will say, it's got nothing to do with you. You know, we love you. You know, we only stayed together for you, whatever. Um, and they basically say, um, and the child says, it has to be my fault. Because before I was here, you were together. Now I'm here, you're not together anymore. Or they might say things like, you know, oh, your parents are separating. Well, who's going to tuck me in at night? Who's going to take me to school? Who's going to write me a story? Who's going to read me a story, right? All the, you know, self-focused things that children go through, right? It's an egocentric mentality. It's not negative. It's not pejorative. It's not a bad thing. It's just that children see the world from their own perspective, and they have a hard time seeing it from other people's perspectives. The next stage is what we call concrete operations. And in the concrete operations stage, um, what we're looking at is, you know, more complicated uh, thinking. So in this stage, um, the thinking, uh, children can start to solve basic math problems, they can order things, they understand conservation, they can take different perspectives. Um, but it's still limited. Okay, they don't have what we call abstract thought. If you watch the video that's linked here, it's a really good video um, comparing children that are in the concrete operation stage to children that are in a formal operation stage that can think abstractly and solve big ideas. So as the thinking develops, going from concrete operations, which is still linear and straightforward, um, to formal operations, the, the thinking process gets more complex, right? More complicated, um, more developed, right? And so they go through what they call the formal operation stage. And you can see a video that, that um, illustrates this pretty well, okay? All right. There are some other concepts in um, Piagetian theory. Okay, one concept is something called equilibrium or, or disequilibrium. Okay, equilibrium is where what you're seeing and what you're observing matches what you know. Okay, so take a second and watch the video that's linked here. Okay, and so pause the pause my video, watch that video. Okay, you're back hopefully. Um, if you watch the video, it was confusing, right? A ball and a feather, bowling ball and a feather fell at the same time. If you're confused and you don't know the experiment here, you're in a state of what we call disequilibrium, where the information you know doesn't match what you're experiencing. You're confused. Once you reach disequilibrium, you have your brain has two different choices, either assimilate or accommodate the information. If you're assimilating the information, you might be saying, oh, it's a magic trick. 
right? This is silly, this doesn't make sense, etc. I'm going to give you a new piece of information that's going to hopefully make you accommodate. A bowling ball and a feather do fall at the same speed. They do. And now you're confused if you don't know the experiment. The only thing that affects their rate of falling is air resistance. So without air, they fall at the same speed. But because the feather has more surface area than the bowling ball, it catches more air. And because it catches more air, it falls more slowly because the air slows it down. What you're witnessing when you watch the feather and the bowling ball is you're watching them in a vacuum. All the air is taken out. So that's how they would normally fall if there's no air there. But air interferes and then slows it down. Okay. Now, now you understand two different things. You understand that all things fall at the same rate, but things fall at the same rate not based on weight, but they fall at the same rate based on air resistance. Okay. And so now you're accommodating the information. Your brain is processing that information and you are now saying, oh, now I understand why the bowling ball and the feather fell at the same rate, even though one is heavier and et cetera. Okay. That's accommodation where you change what you know to fit new information. Assimilation is when you change the information to fit what you know. It's like, no, 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 they can't be falling at the same rate. It's a magic trick. It's not really falling at the same rate. That's assimilation. You know, in your mind, they fall at different rates and they always fall at different rates. And so you're changing what you see to match what you know. Accommodation is when they, you know this new information or you know information and you change what you know to fit what you see. Okay. One of the big concepts in Piagetian theory is that learning is a function of development. Piaget argued that individuals could not learn something unless or couldn't understand something unless they were in the right stage of development. So they had to develop to a point at which they could understand this. So complicated mathematics or abstract thinking or philosophy would be wasted on somebody in the concrete operation stage or somebody in the pre-operation stage or somebody in the sensory motor stage. They couldn't understand it, but they could only learn that stuff if they were in the formal operation stage. So learning happens as a function of development. This is very different from what Lev Vygotsky said. Lev Vygotsky is another theorist, and he focused on the social influences of development. And he said that development happens through social and interpersonal interactions. Okay. Some big concepts in Vygotskyan theory were something called the zone of proximal development, scaffolding, and intersubjectivity. And basically, Vygotsky believed that if you were taught the right way, if somebody gave you the right information, you could learn. It just had to be taught within your realm of understanding. And your realm of understanding was something called the proximal zone or the zone of proximal development. The zone of proximal development was the understanding of information that you had that was just around and near what you already knew. Okay, let me give you a more concrete example. So let's say we're teaching you math. Well, the first thing that we have to do is teach you numbers. Then we have to teach you amounts of things, and then we have to teach you relative amounts and relationships and things like that. Then we teach you addition, then subtraction, then multiplication, division, etc. But I don't just go up to a kid and say, hey, let's start doing division. If they don't know numbers yet, I have to teach numbers. So if they know numbers, their proximal zone, what comes after that, is relative amounts. What's the difference between one and three? Or what's the difference between, you know, one and two? This is addition and subtraction. They know numbers. Their proximal zone just outside what they already know is addition and subtraction. Once they know addition and subtraction, their proximal zone changes. Now their proximal zone goes to multiplication and division. Okay? When I teach them multiplication and division, then we can start doing, you know, uh, algebra, let's say. Okay. Um, and I can keep working outside, you know, just within that proximal zone, right? I can keep working in that area. All right. But I have to figure out where they're at first. I'm not going to take a child that doesn't know addition and start teaching them pre-calculus. And at the same time, I'm not going to take a child that knows pre-calculus and start teaching them addition. I need to know where they're at and I need to work within that area of understanding that's just outside what they know, their proximal zone. Okay. And the proximal zone changes as you learn something. 
And Vygotsky argued that as long as you taught somebody within their proximal zone, they're capable of learning, they're capable of understanding. You just have to find their proximal zone. Okay. Second concept is something called scaffolding. Scaffolding is where you basically give the individual enough support that they need, not that they want, that they need. So you're giving the minimum support to complete tasks. Once they are able to do this task with less support, you withdraw the support over time. Okay. So I'll give you an example. If you're working with a little kid, right? In the very beginning, let's say you're putting puzzles together with the little kid. In the very beginning, the child might not be able to hold the puzzle pieces. They might not be able to understand the concepts and you might have to hold the puzzle piece up, you know, show them on the floor, compare it to a picture, show them in the picture where it goes. And you're doing a lot for them at this point, right? You're holding it up. You're showing them the picture. You're holding it the right way, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot that you're doing for them. Okay. Now, if you, as the child begins to get better at puzzles, they might be able to point where the piece is supposed to go. And they might be able to turn the pieces the right direction. You might have to physically put the pieces in their place because they might not have the motor coordination to do this. So you're offering them support. But you're not going to hold the pieces up anymore in the right space. You're not going to hold them up in the right order, etc. They're going to have to do that. So you're doing less for them. And eventually, you'll just put the puzzle in front of them, and then they'll be able to pick up the pieces, and you don't do anything. You don't help at all. You're withdrawing support as they move on, as they get better. That's the scaffolding process. Lastly, um, is something called intersubjectivity. In intersubjectivity, it's where the individual and the teacher, or the teacher and the learner, doesn't have to be an actual teacher. It's anybody who knows more about something than the individual they're working with. So this could be a, you know, a sibling, this could be a parent, it could be a friend, but just somebody who knows more than them. Um, basically, what they talk about in intersubjectivity is the idea that working together, sharing ideas, um, develop into a new combined and shared understanding of something, right? Vygotsky talked everything about the shared experience and how that can bring people forward and encourage learning and development. And that was his big thing. Okay. So for Vygotsky, development is a function of learning. You develop and you grow over time because you learn something new and anybody could be taught something new. At least he argued that, which is very different than Piaget. Piaget is basically saying, if you don't have the understanding, you have to get to the level of understanding first before you can process this new information. You have to develop cognitively enough so you can process this new complicated information. Vygotsky said the other way. The only way to learn it is, the only way to develop to that point is if somebody teaches you the right way. Okay, two very different ideas. All right. Um, and the truth is, it's both. They're both right. Um, in the extremes right it's more piagetian theory and in the middle areas it's more vygotskian theory and let me explain what i mean by that let's say you have somebody who is of average level intelligence in the middle well it's very vygotskian if you teach them right they'll learn more if you teach them wrong or you teach them less they'll learn less simple but what if it's the extremes if you have somebody that is at the top of the charts in intelligence well, they're going to get there and they're going to understand this stuff no matter how much teaching you do, right? Or how little teaching you do. They'll probably get it, okay? So that's more Piagetian. Same goes with somebody at the bottom end, right? If somebody is profoundly developmentally delayed um, and they have, let's say, IDD, right? Intellectual de developmental delays or intellectual developmental disabilities. If they're profoundly, profoundly delayed, there's not much that you can do with them. No matter how much teaching you do, they're probably not going to get to the upper echelons of information like somebody with a very high or even average IQ. So in that case, Piagetian theory makes more sense. It's not to say that they can't learn. They can, but they're going to be limited by their cognitive abilities. Okay? So in the extremes, Piaget's theory has more of an effect, uh, maybe more accurate um, and in the middle areas, maybe Vygotskyan theory is more accurate, but who knows, right? They're going to argue that their theories are perfect or great, okay? All right, two more things and then we're done. First, we talked about attachment styles. Um, now we're going to talk about parenting. Just like we had attachment styles that came uh, in four different combinations, 
um, a researcher named Baumrand did research on parenting. And he measured parenting in two different domains, warmth and control. Warmth was how receptive you were, and control was your level of, um, I don't want to say discipline, but your level of rules and boundaries. It's not about being strict or harsh. It's just about setting limits that are appropriate. And there are different ways to do this, right? And same thing with warmth. There are different ways to be warm to your child, right? Different ways to be receptive, okay? And this is the overall style that we're talking about, okay? It's not just one behavior. So Baumann basically measuring on warmth and control came up with four different parenting styles. One low on warmth, high on control, high on warmth, high on control, high on warmth, low on control, low on warmth, low on control. Okay. Authoritarian, authoritative, indulgent, and neglectful. Okay. And you can see the definitions of each of these, right? I'm not going to go through them. What I'm going to say is that Baumrand argued that one was ideal. Which one do you think was ideal? He's going to argue that the authoritative parent is ideal. Here's the reason why. High warmth, if you think about attachments and parenting and all that kind of stuff, um, these are parents that are receptive to their child's needs. And if your early relationships are modeling later life relationships, you want somebody to develop relationships where they know that people are caring and receptive. And so they'll be caring and receptive with others. Okay? That's warmth. The other part of this that's important is control. I'm not talking about spanking or I'm not talking about punishments. I'm talking about understanding rules and boundaries. What's, what's okay to do, what's not okay to do. If you raise somebody with higher levels of control, they'll know how to behave across situations. They'll know how to be appropriate. They'll know what they're allowed to do and what they're not supposed to do. And if you imbibe these rules early on, Baumrind is arguing, um, that you would end up developing an, a high-functioning adult. And really, that's the goal of parenting, a high-functioning, healthy, independent adult, right? That's really what it is. And if that's the goal, then having somebody that is high on warmth or raised with a parent that's high on warmth and high on control is going to have or produce the ideal outcome, okay? All right, and you can see why the others are potentially difficult. Okay, last thing. I know it's a long video, but here we go. We're wrapping up. Temperament. Another thing that developmental researchers study is something called temperament. Okay, temperament is your overall emotional style and how you respond to change. Many researchers argue that temperament is biological. It's there with you from birth and it doesn't change throughout the rest of your life. It's how you react to change. It's your overall style. Temperament is not behavior. We can see how temperament influences behavior, but your temperament is not your behavior. Your behavior changes in situations. It changes with age. It changes over time. But researchers are going to argue that your temperament stays the same. Okay? And research has indicated three different temperament styles. Okay? Easy, difficult, and slow to warm up. Okay? The easy child um, tends to be <clears throat> easier for caregivers. Um, they, they tend to get toilet trained easily because this is a change. They tend to sleep through the night regularly. Um, they tend to have easy routines, right? Um, they tend to adjust to new situations quickly and easily, etc. The difficult child, um, they might be fussy or feisty. Uh, they might cry loudly at anything new, and they might adapt slowly, okay? The slow-to-warm-up child um, might be a child that, you know, is typically stands at, like, the edge of the group, clings quietly to his or her parents when they're taken to a store or a birthday party. Um, they might be shy when they're pushed to join a group, etc., okay, as, as children. As adults these children, uh, these adults, excuse me, might demonstrate similar behaviors, um, but sorry, might have similar temperaments, but might demonstrate these differently, right? So the slow to warm up child 
you know, who clings to their parents' leg at a new gathering is not going to cling to their parents' leg as an adult. But in a party, they might kind of like enter slowly, kind of hang out by, you know, the food or the drinks and, you know, kind of wait for their opportunity to enter the group. Where in the easy person like jumps into the party, starts introducing themselves, shaking hands, hugging people, etc. The difficult person might just fold their hands in the corner and not interact with anybody else, not talk to anybody else and really kind of be on their phone the whole time or texting or whatever, Instagramming, tweeting, whatever, right? That might be what it looks like as an adult, okay? And we can see these patterns. <coughs> Excuse me. And we can see them, uh, you know, manifesting very early on and staying consistent throughout the individual's life, okay? And it's not to say temperament can't change. Some research indicates that it can or that it might be possible to change. Um, but it typically stays more stable than not. Okay. All right. So that's it on the lifespan development video. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, and again, you can always email if there are any questions or concerns. Okay. All right.